Good morning. Sorry, we're running late a little bit. Traffic's got in the way of some of us getting here, but thank you for battling through it and joining us today. It's very good to see such a, a healthy turnout, and, I, and I'm not surprised a few familiar faces in the audience. Uh, my name's Martine Croxall. I'm a presenter with the BBC News Channel, but today I have the pleasure of moderating today's debate and of welcoming you here to the European Parliament UK Information Office. Each year, this office hosts a debate with the UCL European Institute to coincide with the awarding of the European Parliament's Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought. Named after the Soviet scientist and dissident Andrei Sakharov, the award was created in 1988 to honour people and organisations defending human rights and fundamental freedoms. 2018 marks 30 years since the Sakharov Prize was first conferred. This year, the award has gone to the Ukrainian film director Oleg Sentsov, He's been sentenced to 20 years in prison for plotting terrorist <coughs> acts against uh, Ru the uh, Russian de facto rule in Crimea, which, of course, as we know, been in the news again this week. The judges of the prize said, through his courage and determination by putting his life in danger, the filmmaker Oleg Sensov has become a symbol of the struggle for the release of political prisoners held in Russia and around the world. By awarding him the Sakharov Prize, the European Parliament is expressing its solidarity with him and his cause. We ask that he be released <coughs> immediately. His struggle reminds us that this is our duty to defend human rights everywhere in the world and under all circumstances. There were two other finalists. They were 11 non-governmental organisations rescuing migrants across the Mediterranean Sea. And Nasser Zezafi, the leader of the uh, Moroccan mass protest movement, Hirak. Our discussion isn't always linked to the achievements or the field of the prize winner, and this year, the focus is on another highly topical issue which has drawn you here today. Control taken back, Brexit, the people and Parliament. So, the idea of taking back control uh, played a central role in the Leave campaign. It's been a theme for the Prime Minister, Theresa May, in delivering Brexit. The question now, though, is whether Mrs May's withdrawal agreement will, in fact, return power to the UK... Uh, the control it has over its borders, its laws and our way of life. On the day that the withdrawal agreement was finally uh, agreed and revealed, the headline on the Evening Standard, edited of course by George Osborne, uh, was the EU takes back control. The implication was that the UK would become a rule taker and would no longer be a rule maker. Last weekend, the Sunday Express helpfully published Theresa May's 40 reasons to back the agreement. The top three were free movement of people coming to an end with the introduction of a new skills-based immigration system, taking back full control of our money, minus the divorce settlement, and the jurisdiction of the uh, European <laughs> Court of Justice in the UK coming to an end. It's important to uh, mention the context we find ourselves in today. There is still a lot to be agreed upon, and we can't foresee whether the withdrawal agreement will pass through Parliament However, we can't really get bogged down in too many what-if scenarios. We, we can't avoid, uh, avoid that entirely, but we will try to focus on the legislative content of the proposed agreement, which will in turn have an impact on hypothetical outcomes. I realise that some of our speakers may prefer other outcomes entirely uh, and have views on the likelihood of Parliament approving the deal. Uh, if you'd like to tweet about this event, please use the hashtag Sakharov UK and uh, don't draw any inferences from <laughs> I was going to wear the same ones. <laughs> <laughs> With a kitten heel. Um, we're joined by four guest speakers uh, from whom we'll hear from individually in a moment. Uh, then we'll have a group discussion and uh, then I will ask for questions from you for 25, 30 minutes. Uh, the European Parliament's Information Office here in the UK and the University College London have sought to create a panel with a wide range of experience and backgrounds, political, legal, business and academic, to foster a balanced and wide-ranging debate around Brexit. So let me introduce them. James, or Jim Carver, as we know him, is an MEP for the West Midlands, elected for UKIP in 2014. He resigned from the party after 22 years' membership earlier this year, stating he'd become increasingly out of kilter with the direction of UKIP. A former Social Democrat who changed his opinion on the then European community after reading the Maastricht Treaty, he sits on the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs and Human Rights Committee. Gina Miller is founding partner of SCM Direct, which she set up with her husband, Alan, after the financial crisis. Um, it's designed to be a disruptive digital wealth manager centred on transparency, low cost, 
and putting clients first. Her areas of expertise and work cover investments, charities, democracy, and political processes, as well as social justice. In 2016, you may recall, Gina successfully challenged the UK government over its authority to implement Brexit, winning in the High Court and the Supreme Court in what was hailed as the most important British constitutional case for 200 years. Ronan McRae is Professor of Constitutional uh, Law at uh, University College London. He's a member of the Bar of England and Wales and the Bar of Ireland and a formal judicial clerk at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. He writes regularly on matters of European and constitutional law for newspapers such as the Irish Times and the Financial Times. And Matthew Goodwin is an academic, a writer and consultant known for his work on Britain and Europe, political volatility and risk, populism, Brexit and elections. He's Professor of Politics at Rutherford College, the University of Kent, Senior Visiting Fellow at Chatham House and Senior Fellow with the UK in a Changing Europe academic programme. Matthew's written six books, published dozens of peer-reviewed academic studies and contributes regularly to international media. These are your panellists today. Uh, so I'd like to start with um, a five minute at most people. Um, opening statement from each of, of our speakers. And we'll start, I think, with Jim. Thank you, Marty. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, if a week is a long time in politics, two years certainly is a long time because speaking is possibly the, the only Brexiteer in the room. Um, I love putting my head, up, my head above the parapet. I love engaging with people of a different political opinion with me. And of course, in years gone by, I shared your opinion. I was formerly a social democrat. I believed wholeheartedly in the European economic community. I saw it very much as a trading model and something we should be getting behind. But my opinion changed at the time of the Maastricht Treaty, because that's when it, it became apparent to me, I reached my conclusion that we are heading now towards a European Union, which really is about taking sovereign control and becoming the mantra of ever closer union and pushing countries closer together, which I think is a tragedy because to my mind, the great strength of Europe and the great beauty of Europe is its diversity. The fact that you have so many different nation states with so many different cultures. I think that's a good thing. The idea that we're being harmonized, homogenized and pasteurized and being made into this new European model, I think, is something that to, is to the detriment of the European Union, it, it's gone against them, and this is why we've seen, as, as is so often referred to as the rise of populism. Um, people say, what is, you know, what is happening with populism? I know Matthew will be speaking very much about that in a bit. But I actually feel, is it any wonder things have changed because people really feel very disenfranchised by what has happened. I, I represent the West Midlands, although originally a Londoner, I've lived in the West Midlands for 20 years. And in the West Midlands, a very diverse, multiracial region. We had a fantastic result in that referendum result. 59% of the West Midlands voted to leave the European Union. It was the highest scoring region throughout the country, or throughout the United Kingdom, um, for a leave vote. And what was clear to me was engaging right away across the farming communities to the different ethnic minority communities within the inner cities, right away across the business communities. It was about taking back sovereign control. And there are calls for a people's vote, no doubt Gina will speak about that. I really do contend that we had the people's vote in 2016. And that was a huge wake up call to the establishment, to the political parties, when actually they said, no, this, we want a different way to do things. And to my mind, the great strength of democracy is accountability. And I have to say, as one of your members of the European Parliament, I find it extremely frustrating that I cannot even initiate legislation. All legislation in the European Parliament has to come through the Commission. It goes to the Council, it goes, it goes to the Parliament. And you find that the Parliament works in such a way where you have a limited number of, shall we say, people in the know who very much work together on the legislation. And by the time it goes to committee and amendments are put forward, which are nearly always go in the favour of the, of the larger political groups. You very much end up with something very close to what the European Commission proposed in the first place. So I say by leaving the European Union, we can actually reclaim our position as a global trading nation. We'll have the ability to negotiate our own trade agreements if we can get away from this awful Brexit deal, which actually, I have to contend as a Brexiteer, leaves us in a far weaker position as a nation, and we would have been if we'd voted to remain in that referendum. Um, 
That's how, that's how bad a deal it is. I have, I have many friends in other parties of other political persuasions within the European Parliament who I spend a lot of time with and they openly say to me, I've, I won't name them, but politicians from other nationalities saying what a bad deal it is. We cannot believe how lucky we are. You, we've got you over a barrel. And they can't believe their luck. Ladies and gentlemen, if they think it's a bad deal for us, I think it's a bad deal. And whether you share my point of view, whether you share Gina's point of view, it's not the Brexit we wanted. It's not the Brexit, the Brexit that British people voted for. And I fear if we don't have the Brexit that people voted for, we're going to be in a situation where well, populism, I believe, will take a very nasty turn. And one of the reasons I got involved in my old party, UKIP, in the early days was because I saw a rise in nationalism coming. I'm a grandson of a Polish Jewish refugee on one side. I'm a gra grandson of a Roman Egyptian on the other. And believe you me, I know firsthand what happens when racism turns nasty. You know, I get a lot of racist abuse because of my Roman heritage, things I wouldn't repeat in this room. I know it's shocking some of the abuse <coughs> Gina has faced, and I condemn that wholeheartedly. That is not what Britain is about. It's about Britain in a wider world. That is why so many people, British people, of different, different ethnic backgrounds got behind the concept of leaving the European Union because they realise the world is bigger than the 28 member states, soon to be 27 member states of the European Union. They understand they have the family networks, the business networks, and I really do believe that the world is a royster, but I fear our future is as a clam if we go ahead with this deal that has been negotiated, supposedly, by the Prime Minister. Thank you. Jim, thank you very much. Uh, Ronan, I'll ask you to speak next. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. So I'm going to talk just briefly about how do we get where we are, um, what that means we should do now, and maybe what that means for the UK constitutional system in the future. Uh, I think one thing is that it looks like the Brexit process has done anything but enhance Parliament sovereignty. It's now clear that any deal with the EU will involve the UK becoming a rule taker. Now, I think that Bre Brexit could only ever have been like that. Either pointless, Britain stays in the single market and follows the rules without any votes, or disruptive, leaves the single market and suffers some economic consequences. Now, the government is obviously afraid of economic disruption, so they're trying to get a, a fairly, go for a fairly pointless Brexit, even though that means that in future, Parliament will then lose the ability it now has to indirectly influence EU laws by holding ministers, UK ministers, to account for how they vote in relation to those EU laws. I think it's even more interesting that other uh, critics of the government want to diminish Parliament's power in another way. Because in, in relation to Brexit, we see an awful lot of people saying that anything but the hardest of Brexit is inconsistent with the will of the people as expressed in the referendum. But what that does is reduces Parliament from being an independent decision maker for the UK to being something more like a court, just restricted to interpreting the will or what other people meant by decisions when they took it. And the point, the problem is that if we interpret Brexit, the decisions of people to leave the European Union, you're interpreting an impossibly vague instruction, something that could have meant a whole range of things. And actually, none of the issues that have defined the debate on what kind of Brexit we should have since the referendum were properly discussed during the referendum. There were very blasé assurances about worries about being a vassal state. Oh, don't worry, German car makers will make Angela Merkel uh, ensure that Britain retains membership, uh, membership benefits of the single market. There was no sustained discussion of £39 billion payments or really much discussion of the border with the, the Republic of Ireland. Now, there was a case for Brexit, there still is. If, if you believe, which I don't, that the EU is like a colonial ruler, you could reasonably argue Brexit will be disruptive economically, but that disruption is worth it to be sovereign and free. And that's in Ireland in 1922, Algeria in 1962. They made decisions to break away from Britain and France that probably in the median term made them poorer, but they didn't mind. They wanted to be free. But that's not the case for Brexit that was ever really made. I think the media should be pretty self-critical in this regard. I think actually it's very unpopular, but I think the electorate should be asking itself difficult questions. Not about how they voted, but about how the debate was so badly failed to focus on what was at stake. We treat voters as consumers who are always right 
rather than citizens with a civic duty to inform themselves. And that's a, a, a view of democracy that's very unhealthy in the long run. Politicians respond to incentives, and voters simply don't provide politicians with any incentives to tell them the truth. It appears in the UK that a lot of people felt ignored, understandably, by a metropolitan elite, and they felt they didn't have any control over any key issues like mass migration. And they decided to use the Brexit referendum to make those points, notwithstanding that they're not really on the ballot. And that's not specific to the UK. In Ireland, we've had loads of EU referendums, and in every single one, it's been hijacked by people who are worried about military neutrality or abortion, even though those weren't really on the ballot. So to finish up, Given that the referendum was so flawed, should Parliament take control and move from an impossible attempt to interpret the Leave decision to either reversing Brexit itself or taking decisive action to minimise its impact? Yes and no. While the referendum was flawed, once the people make a decision, you can't reverse it without undermining the sustaining myth of democracy, the idea that the people are the source of authority. The people might have been ignorant or misled, but their decision has to stand. There's no guarantee that any other referendum will, will be any more effectively debated than the one be, that we've had before. But, so that means that we're the, only chance, the only choice is for Britain, sorry, yeah, just finishing up. Um, I'll finish up, is to, that Britain has to choose between two unenviable options, becoming a rule taker or economic disruption. But without a referendum, Parliament is still entitled to wide discretion in choosing the form of Brexit it wants. It's absurd to claim that 52% of people were firmly against, for example, the membership of the Customs Union. The unenviable position Britain is in means, perhaps, that politicians will think twice before putting issues to referendum in the future. So it may be that in the long run, Parliament gains back some of the control it has lost by the increasing use of referendums in the future. But I don't think that's what anyone thought they meant by taking back control. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to just go back a little bit to the beginning of all of this. Um, and to say that going back to the future, if you like, it's the fact that uh, we find ourselves in a place which is not unsurprising because of how this all started. It was a political play. It was badly thought out. There was no plan. And I can say this in, with full knowledge that I started out on the referendum trail in October 2015 when the debates were happening in London, around London. On the Remain side, there were very few businesses who wanted to speak up, so I tended to be on most panels against um, Remain and Leavers. And there was a huge amount of ideological and what-if debating. But in the green rooms, or afterwards, there was a consensus that Leave was not going to win. And that came from Leavers as well, or those who were supporting Leave. There were those who fell into the camp that they never wanted to join in the first place, so what I call the old guard Brexiteers, um, who had never changed their minds anyway and didn't want the first, the the first in, in the first place. And then there were the group who ideologically think that it's not really about Brexit, it's about what Britain, sort of country Britain becomes. One where we do lower our regulations, where we do have a much more, in a way, a right-wing agenda as a country. Um, and that, that is an ideological argument. And then I think there are the third camp, there who people who really did feel the unhappy with the direction of travel with Europe. But none of them thought that Leave was going to win. And because of that, when the vote did happen, um, they had to find a plan very quickly. And that's by chance where we've ended up to, is that in no other part of life can I think of such a huge or any major decision being made without a plan and actually making it up as you go along. We've ended up here by accident with a withdrawal agreement that gives up control. That means that I've never seen an agreement or an international or a draft, any legal draft, that actually has 31st of December 20XX in it. <laughs> 
this is a legally binding document that does have redress, the ECJ will have redress because they are the resolution court in international law. We will become rule takers for, as far as I can see, a very, very long time. And how have we come into the position where, where there is no equivalent to Article 50 in the withdrawal agreement? There is no sovereignty there. Because for all the arguments about taking back sovereignty, the argument is somewhere between 11 and 13 percent is how much we've ceded in terms of laws to the EU. It is then that small. And we ceded that amount of sovereignty for the benefits of peace, prosperity, oh, and security. Yugoslavia. So we are now going to be in a position that's so much worse because the political declaration that sits alongside the withdrawal agreeing might as well be a letter to Father Christmas. <laughs> it is a wish list. There is nothing in there that's legally binding. And it can't start to be the document we discuss until after the transition period. So for all of those who say we ought to leave with no deal, because that's a better option, I just want to, because I'm interested only in practical issues. I'm really not interested in the noise and the bluster and the sound bites. It is not going to help any of us, irrespective of how we voted then and how we may vote if we are given the democratic choice to ratify the deal or the options on the table. What I want to just point out here is that when we joined for 45 years, we made a choice. We made a choice to give up infrastructure to not recruit in certain elements, to not have certain talents, to not have negotiators, to not have lawyers who do this. We gave up. It's like saying, rather than having your kitchen, we'll eat out every night. We gave up the infrastructure. It will take time, many, many years, a lot of money to put back those structures in place. And how does that help the people who want Britain to serve them better? The money, the time, the bandwidth will be taking up with trying to get us back to a place we were when the world is moving on. It makes, this is total insanity. Gina, thank you very much. Matthew. The generous Matthew, aren't they? Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> He hasn't even said anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in, in modern political history, uh, Brexit, in fact, in all of Britain's history, you could argue that Brexit was the first moment when a majority of people outside of Parliament formally asked for something that a majority of people inside Parliament did not want to give. So, Brexit can never truly be satisfied. I mean, it's inevitable that we're here with the country being as divided and polarised as it is, because Brexit as, a, as an entity can never fully be, be satisfied in a way that will bring the country together. It's a moment that's also cut directly across our traditional party politics, like a hot knife through butter, that the Labour Party awoke on June 24th, 2016, to be confronted with the realisation that two-thirds of Labour-held constituencies had voted to leave the European Union. And meanwhile, the Conservative Party today grapples with the fact that while 70% of Conservative voters want to leave the European Union, a not insignificant 30% still want to remain in the European Union. So Brexit has partly uh, accelerated uh, the realignment of our politics. We've seen uh, a significant number of working class Labour voters defect to the Conservative Party, given giving the centre right probably the best election that it's had among the working class in this country since the days of Margaret Thatcher, if not before. And we've seen pro EU middle class voters defect from the Conservative Party uh, to vote for Labour or the Liberal Democrats, giving Jeremy Corbyn many of the middle class liberal professionals and the millenni millennial students, like my students in Canterbury, 
uh, the groups that a new anti-Brexit centrist party would need. There is simply no space in British politics for a new anti-Brexit movement, uh, in my view, given that the voters that you would need for such an enterprise are already firmly placed within the yes. Labour electorate, and they don't seem to have much of an intention uh, of moving. Um, but that also takes us into the fact that we have seen something remarkable in the past two years, which is uh, a public opinion uh, climate that has remained remarkably static. Uh, remarkably static. Uh, we are as polarized as we could be. Uh, according to the latest uh, opinion poll by YouGov, which has been running ever since the referendum, in hindsight, was the decision, was the decision uh, to, to vote to leave the European Union right or wrong. 46% say it was wrong, 42% say it was right. Uh, the remainder don't know or are undecided. The margin of error in most polls is three points. I would not want to make a call as to how a second referendum uh, would uh, play out. Um, why has public opinion stayed so, so static? Because this issue was never transactional. This issue was never about the detail of public policy. It wasn't even about the detail of withdrawal agreements or the detail of who gets what, when and where. This was a value-based vote. If you voted Remain, this was an expression of who you are. You're internationalist, you are more cosmopolitan, you're socially liberal. If you voted Leave it in the same way, it was an expression of who you are. You put a much greater premium on stability, conformity. You want to slow the pace of change, authority, and so forth. And we've had almost 15 studies since the referendum on why people ended up voting Leave. And they all tell a remarkably consistent story, that the vote was driven by two key uh, factors. Uh, one was the desire for sovereignty, to reclaim uh, control laws uh, to push back against the ECJ and the jurisdiction of European courts. And the second was to lower uh, immigration and to reform uh, the free movement of EU nationals. Now, re regardless of how people perceive those two issues, by a mile, they were the two most important drivers of the Leave vote. So if you want to then work back from the question of how do we respond to this and get through this period of polarization, then my final point would be that whatever outcome we have, whether it is Theresa May's deal, whether it is another deal, um, whether it is something else, uh, we cannot, I, I think, conceivably move forward without addressing uh, the two core uh, drivers uh, of the Leave vote that got us here to begin with. Because if we don't, we'll simply be back here again five or ten years uh, from now. Thank you. Well, we'll talk about some of the, how you address those drivers a, a little bit later on, if we can. We haven't actually left the European Union yet, of course, have we? So what I impact has the, the vote and also the, the negotiations so far to get to Brexit, uh, what are the impact has that had? Uh, just a, a quick comment from each of you first. Matthew, how well have, have, have voters engaged with those negotiations? How It is very complicated. Uh, we, we spend many, many hours, certainly on the BBC News Channel, talking about it and f often feel like you haven't moved very far. So how well engaged and well informed are the public? Well, the, the issue with Brexit is that, um, in general terms, this is a low information environment, uh, which sounds odd given that we talk about it every day. But um, what I mean by that is there are lots of voters who aren't tuning in anywhere near to the extent that, say, London and SW1 and the media or the the newspapers are. So as of yesterday, for example, 21% of the country had not heard anything about the draft Brexit deal. Okay, so one in five. Uh, as of last month, over 40% of the country said they had never heard of the customs union or they had heard of it but didn't know anything about it. Um, now that's not for a second to say that voters are stupid or ignorant or uneducated. It's just simply that people have other things going on in their lives and they're not zooming in on the detail to the extent that we think. And that obviously contains some pretty clear risks, which is when we get to the next crunch moment in this uh, process, which may well be a, a, another referendum, um, we are going to have to um, deal with the fact that we have a, a, a not insignificant portion of the electorate that it, 
does not have really much of an awareness over the key things that we're debating and we're discussing, uh, how to define them, what they do, you know, uh, what our relationship to them is, and that in itself is a major problem. Jim, how representative is that of your constituents? How well engaged are they, well informed about what's happening and where, we, where, where we've got to? I think it's actually very hard being, a bit, being an MEP. I'm one of seven for the West Midlands that represents 6.3 million people. So people do vote, you know, I, we do, and I know I speak to other MEPs, we all do a lot of constituency work. Um, something I've actually think I've enjoyed the most out of it all. Uh, but it's very difficult to engage yes, with, 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 exactly with your Member of Parliament. You know, I'm representing what, 57 parliamentary, 58 parliamentary constituencies across my region. So all you can do is sort of, when you speak to people on the street, I'm, uh, it's clear to me that actually I think there are a lot of people who voted to remain in a referendum are actually very disgusted with how, how the negotiations have been handled on the European side of things. And they're saying, well, if they're treated in such a way, if there was another referendum, I would vote differently. So what I think you're going to see, if, if there was another referendum, as Gina hopes for, you'll see actually a switch on both sides. You'll see people who voted to, to leave vote to remain, and people who voted to remain would now vote to leave. And that was borne out in the opinion poll a couple of months ago. We saw the big headline was that 400,000 leavers uh, <coughs> changed their mind to vote remain in a referendum. The, under, the underline to that was at 500,000 Remainers have changed their mind and would now vote to leave. So I think actually the media narrative doesn't actually help to clarify the situation. But I'm not surprised how hardline the negotiations have been because what people don't appreciate is that the, with regards to the European Parliament Brexit negotiating team, the lead negotiator is, of course, Keith Hofstadt, the leader of the Liberal Democrat group within the European Parliament, um, a federalist, a, a complete Euro federalist. Um, but what's really interesting about that? Is he's a member of the Spinelli Group? The Spinelli Group is a is a group that calls for you know the process of speeding up the process of European integration. But he's not the only one. I think of the of this of the six members of that of that group. Four of those members: Elmer Brock, Roberto Galtieri, uh, Donna uh, Hub, uh, Sana Hubner, the former commissioner, and Guy Verhofstadt are all members of the Spinelli Group. So that tells you Elmer Brock, for example, who's the former chair of the committee I sit on. Um, when Prime Minister Cameron used a veto at the council some years ago, he said he, in a, he was, he's, you know, he's on the record of saying it's time uh, that, the, uh, that the full power was brought out against that country to show them their real loss of influence. Well, maybe this is what you're referring to now. He's involved in the Brexit negotiations. Jim, thank you. Uh, Gina. Can you asked the question again. You didn't answer the question. Uh, Not at all. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, well, well if, if you want me to answer it again, I'll. Well, you answered it at the beginning when I asked yeah. you how well yeah. engaged they are. Yeah. He says yeah. That he's you know, it, the, point, the point I made was that you know we represent large regions. Yeah, I know yeah. about that. But you were asked. Yeah, and I gave people an answer. Yeah. Of, of course, people know everything, and people are engaged. Some do, some don't. You know, people are um, engaged. People are engaged throughout the referendum. I, I took part in 42 public debates, and every debate, the issue of the Irish border came up, the issue of customs union came up. 42 public debates I did during that referendum. Gina, um, you obviously, as we talked about, we wanted to make sure that. Parliament had the opportunity to have a say in mm. whether, how Brexit was implemented. How well do you think Parliament's been able to check and influence and hold the executive to account so far? Um, I, I'll answer that question. I just want to say something about the first question you were asking the panel um, about how well um, people are engaged and understand. I think it's, it is shameful that more effort hasn't been made especially with the internet, to, get, to allow people to be informed. And that's why, again, not just with the court case, um, but you know, I've had to launch a campaign called End the Chaos, because it is chaos.co.uk, where if we are able to provide information, to translate reports, to get things out and proactively push it out to people through Facebook, through social media, so they can understand what is going on, because I think people have the right to, uh, to be informed in a way that they understand. That is a right that they have, and I think it is disgraceful that cross-party there has not been a movement to do that, and that it's fallen to me and a small group of us to do this work. Because what we have discovered is that, just to give you two examples, one is that it has surprised me, probably not, um, Professor, that uh, 
people have not been more alarmed about no deal, about the reports from the government, about the um, coming from the businesses, big businesses, local businesses, all, all who have been coming out. Actually, what we discovered was that there is a vast sway of that 38, 40% who would vote no deal tomorrow if we did have a public vote, because their perception is that no deal means remaining. And we discovered that by going out and engaging with people all around the country, in many leave areas, in many, many remain areas as well as leave. We have gone around the country. And that is really important. And our top question on our FAQs that, that search is, what is Brexit? Which buys into exactly what you've said. So there is a real lack of engagement, and that is criminal as far as I'm concerned. In, in answer to your second question, there has not been enough scrutiny. We requested uh, freedom of information in the impact, the 58 impact studies. We requested how many of the 650 MPs had gone into that room where they had to leave their mobiles and phones and actually read the reports. The answer was 87. One person went in three times. That is not, the, I am shamed, for, I'm shamed of our MPs who are not taking their duties seriously enough and providing the scrutiny that we pay them to do because they're our representatives. And I think there should be a lot more engagement from MPs, not to just reflect what the will of the people is, but to actually shape how the negotiations go, what happens to our country, and what happens to the future. That is actually what we pay them for. Ronan, how has the balance changed then between the government <coughs> and civil servants and the legislature since the Brexit vote? Well. I think the sad thing is that, from UK terms, both the government, civil servants, and the legislature have all been disempowered. The EU is constrained in what it can give. It is offering market access and, uh, and, ru and rule taking or no deal. There, that's, the, that's always what Brexit is going to be, a choice between those two. That means that Parliament, you know, Parliament is in this take it or leave it position. Not really because, and the EU is in that position, not because it's been driven by Guy Verhofstadt, because the parliament has not been very influential in the, in the negotiation process. Every single member state, even very Eurosceptic states like the Czech Republic, um, like uh, the sort of Denmark, and they've, they've all agreed with the EU's approach because they know that the single market is a package deal, and if Britain cherry picks, it, everyone will want to do that and will start to unravel. So the key thing is we're stuck. Parliament is stuck with taking a manifestly worse deal than membership, much worse, or taking the potential chaos of a no deal. So even for Remainers uh, it's a, who, want, uh, who are pushing for, to reject this deal, it's quite a high stakes game. The question is not is it a good deal, is it is the deal so bad that it's worth risking no deal? That is a really high stakes game. The last thing I just want to say is about EU and referendums is that uh, both sides have made the EU projected all these kind of things onto the EU that it's not really about. Remainers equally. Mm. The EU is not actually all about multiculturalism and internationalism. The rights given to non-EU nationals under EU law are pretty minimal, for instance, and they're quite tough with non-EU citizens. Similarly, uh, <coughs> Leavers have projected all things about immigration, multiculturalism onto it, onto the EU. The problem was the electorate felt excluded, it had a referendum about the EU and then pushed a load of feelings and issues about things like migration into that referendum. But now we're stuck in the position of respecting this sacred decision about the EU that often was driven by things nothing to do with the EU. And that's a really disempowering position Is for the civil servant in Parliament. Can I move on and talk about the rights of EU and UK citizens and how they, that will change, Jim, in your view, how well they'll be protected when I would, Britain leaves. I would hope, well, well uh, the proof of pudding will be in the eating, of course, you know, and it would be, it would be I think, folly of uh, any four of us to guess what's going to happen with regards to... But based to the on the withdrawal agreement... On the withdrawal agreement, yeah, um, you know, they will be protected. And even, you know, as someone, as many would call me, a hardline lever, um, I always argue that they should be protected all the way through, through, the, through throughout the referendum campaign. Um, it was not a case of, you know, we, we had an obligation un under international law um, and it, it's quite right those, those freedoms are protected. But certainly with regards to freedom of movement for UK citizens, that, that will naturally change. But I would, I would hope actually what's, what the government have, um, have offered with regards to, you know, 
the flexibility and, and with regards to citizens settling in this country might be replicated in other areas. And certainly you're, you're hearing some horror stories coming, coming out from, from the approaches in some member states, which I think actually doesn't show, doesn't show very kindly on their part. Really? So of course it will change. That's right. Uh, people who are already in situ will probably be able to keep going with their lives as they are. The real issues, for instance, for British citizens who live, say, in Luxembourg, they can stay in Luxembourg, but if they get a job in Belgium, and in Luxembourg it's so small, if you get out the wrong side of the bed, you've crossed the border. <laughs> you know? So it's, uh, you know, it's, that'll be certainly very difficult. But th the sad thing is also, this nightmare negotiation that everyone is tired of hearing on the news, that was the easy one. There are the easy set of negotiations. The future relationship is much bigger, covers way more issues, and will also consist effectively of mm. a series of unpalatable choices for the UK. Mm. So we've had the easy, fun bit and the European now. Yeah. Um, and let's the enjoy European the next year. 10 years mm. of talking about the rest of it. Massive. I think that's a really interesting well. point in that uh, it may be during the trade negotiation the next two years that you start to see some of the things that Prime Minister May is going to hang the withdrawal agreement on, for example, well, at least you get reform of free movement, which is the number one or one of the top two issues for leavers. Well, we may end up in a scenario, and certainly this is a fear among conservative Eurosceptics, and certainly at least the ones I talk to, which is that, well, that will go too during the trade negotiation as the UK begins to negotiate access to um, the single market. And it's probably right, but, but this in, in effect reflects the problem all along, which is that... I think both sides have pretty consistently misread one another from, from the beginning. The UK certainly more than the EU in that, you know, there was always this idea that the, the four freedoms would be somehow up for negotiation and discussion. That was always uh, clearly not, not going to be the case. And I think, you know, we can all point to problems like David Cameron's removal from the EPP, which made the Conservative Party more, de more detached from the mood in Brussels and, 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 you know, and so on and so forth. But... Uh, but there is a sort of scenario here that I'm personally quite anxious about, which is, well, if, I'm, if, if we're right and you know, the withdrawal agreement in some form passes and we end up into this trade negotiation and you start to see changes and a toning down of things like the reform of, of even the, the, the issue of free movement, which is really one of the last, last things that the Prime Minister has to hold on to, um, then where does that leave um, the country? Where does that leave the, the people that did end up voting uh, leave. Remainers obviously are going to be dissatisfied with, with the outcome overall. We're also going to then have a, a large number of unhappy leavers who may conclude that they've got nothing out of this, this process apart from being a rule taker and not even getting the reform of immigration which they were, felt especially that's animated about. And that's where we start that's to talk about way. you know, either one of two outcomes I think. The first is what we, what we did see before the referendum, particularly in blue-collar constituencies, which was falling turnout and, and rising apathy and people just withdrawing from the political process, concluding Absolutely. that actually it's not really worth engaging in politics. You can't get anything done or you don't have the information or um, MPs aren't engaging fully enough. And the second is you just have a reboot of what we saw between 2012 and 2015, which is a return of populism and perhaps a rupture on the centre-right of uh, British politics, which, which has threads into... Labour constituencies um, as well. And I don't particularly want to see either of those outcomes because I think both of those outcomes are very damaging for the quality of our democracy. Gina, talk to us, if you would, about your Thanks. view of what the medium to long-term consequences of Brexit are going to be on the Constitution, democracy. How much sovereignty does Parliament get back? How much, how much more empowered will we, we be as UK voters? If this withdrawal agreement gets through on the second vote, we'll have to wait and see. If it gets through, it will have an enormous impact. And I have always felt that Brexit started as a constitutional issue and it will end as a constitutional issue. Because, you know, there is an argument that this withdrawal act actually contravenes the Sovereignty Act because we are giving up so much sovereignty. There are a lot, there's a lot of, uh, I call it a constitutional um, Christopher Columbus is needed right now to go and discover and, and sort of what happens next because we go into I've spoken to so many constitutional lawyers here in the UK and Europe who, and nobody knows what happens because it is we have never been here before there is no certainty 
Be and that is, that is really an odd thing for me to be saying as somebody who believes that the rule of law brings stability and is capable of guiding us through an unknown path. Because in this occasion, it won't, because we don't know. We have never been here or anywhere near this before. So from that point of view, it has not brought back st um, stability. It will do quite the opposite. It will, um, it will take us many, many years because there is always going to be this idea uh, uh, between the two planes. What does it mean on the international plane and what does it mean for us on the domestic plane? And where do those things butt up to each other? And that's where, just, just to give you one really palpable example, so you as a small business, there are 145,000 small businesses who only trade with the EU. And if those businesses have signed something called a contract where the pricing is deliverable price, so you have a good for 100 pounds, you've signed a contract, five, 10 year contract, which says you will deliver that good at 100 pounds, but it's based on a 30 pound profit margin. You cannot get out of that contract because of Brexit. The end, and the impact of the, because there is no frictionless trade in the withdrawal agreement. And the burden of that admin means that your profit margin has just come down to 10 pounds. Where do you go? Because you cannot get out of that contract. You either fire people, cut your costs, or you go out of business. And nobody can figure out how, if you have a dispute, where do you go with that dispute? It, this is totally unknown territory. Jim, how many of our laws will be made domestically in future, do you think, compared with, with, with now? Um, because surely some of those, if we want to trade with the EU, some of our standards will have to mirror those that the, the EU is maintaining. But also, if we want to strike deals with other parts of the world, will we, how hampered will we be by having to stick to those standards? I don't see why we would be hampered, because in some areas those standards are good. Um, absolutely. But what we need is the flexibility to actually mirror, the sta mirror those standards on a global scale. I think it, as we go into WTO, which seems to be the direction, if there is an no deal, deal, if there's an no deal, we will be going. Um, we'll be in a, we, we, the big problem, of course, with WTO is, is, of course, the way President Trump is, is behaving at the moment, which, which I think adds greater uncertainty to it. But I take the view that we have to actually follow what, what was said in good faith, I think, by the Prime Minister, and as someone who's critical of the Prime Minister, you know, of transposing European legislation into the British law books until such time it can be repealed at a later date. You can't have one great repeal bill to repeal all, all the le European legislation in one go. You have to look at some le legislation is very good, but... It's the, great, know, the great copy and paste e bill. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I think that's probably a, probably a better, better way to put it. But, you know, we've, we've been legislating in these areas long before. We, you know, you go back to, I, mean, I remember Tony Benn uh, in an interview some years ago talking about the, the, the best piece of legislation he, he ever introduced, or was most proud of, was the Clean Air Act. Now, I don't know if people in London, if we're in London, there must be some Londoners who grew up during the Great Peace Supers. Um, and that was something, you know, and that, that's an environmental bill as a great example, which, you know, we... we developed as, as a sovereign country. So I'm not saying we, that's going to be any better than the legislation that comes through from Europe. But what I'm doing is using that example to say we have shown an interest in these areas for many, many years. And of course, we will continue to do so. And we will, I'm sure, continue to work alongside, I hope, our European partners after we've left the European Union on areas such as environment, because geographically, we share that environment. Ronan, you were shaking your head. Well, I just want to, it doesn't, Tariffs are one thing, but actually probably more worrying for Britain is mutual recognition and common standards. Because it doesn't matter that if, in fact, Britain has the same standards as, as the EU, once they're out of the single market, then there's no longer the obligation on other EU states to recognize those standards okay. as equivalent. So even if Britain says, oh, don't worry about it, we have the same standards, it's if you're not world. in the single market, you won't get mutual recognition. And the reason businesses like the EU uh, and EU single market law is because it, re it requires member states not to engage in the kind of trickery that you have in, in um, kind of trying to secretly protect your market by saying, oh, you know, your bottles are the wrong size or your la label is the wrong thing. EU law means they can't do that, but that won't, it doesn't matter if Britain keeps the same standards. Once you're out of the single market, that disruption will kick in. 85% of the countries, of, uh, of the small companies in the UK trade within the UK. Um, so. I, I'm sorry, I, I, have to, I have to take a view that actually 
we've got to come back to the fact that at the end of the day, you know, I, I've changed the old saying, I won't say what it is, but I quite say money talks and politics walks because we buy far more from the European Union and buy from us. It is going to be in their interests. And if, no. if, if I'm sorry, if we leave with a no deal, were we to leave with a no deal, I sincerely believe that we'd have a deal very quickly within, within 12 months. Because the, I'll tell you why, because I think, I think the pressure coming in from the, from the French champagne producers, from the French wine producers, we're their largest market, from the automotive producers, we buy their products because they're great products, we like them. But can I, can I say the G. facts actually matter? It's really important. We are such a crucial stage. Can we stop this? Really important we actually look at facts. We submitted to the WTO in July a draft schedule of tariffs, which was rejected. We are nowhere near having a deal at WTO. And when we break the contract with the EU, because uh, we are memberships of WTO under yeah. the EU, the they, have to we, they will renegotiate it with the EU bloc before us. Also, there are eight of our major countries around the world who have already said that they will be protectionist against us and will not give us a trade deal that we have been approached. Japan, Australia, New Zealand um, have already said no. India have said Australia on condition, no, they have said on condition, India has said on condition of free movement. I mean, this is really the facts this really do matter. And the, German and the average time to negotiate is about 10 years. Yeah. And do not quote Canada to me, because that took seven years, but it was actually 20 years in the making, in the boiling, before you got to the seven. WTO is not there and will not be done in any time near in the future that we can see. But that is not even the problem, because that is not about trade. We are an 80% service economy. In my field in financial services, equivalence, where we have now passporting, will be replaced with equivalence. Equivalence can be revoked in a month with a month's notice in my sector. Each individual country in the EU will be able to define what their view of equivalence, whereas at the moment we have one single rule book. It is no way is equivalence going to just mean that we operate exactly the same way. The burdens on businesses, the, the infrastructure, the time, the effort, it will have. There is no deal out there that is better, more prosperous, more secure than the special deal we already have. That is the end of it. And people, I think, have the right to decide if they want to carry on with what they now know and if they want to take that other choice. People deserve that right because that's when I think we will have the real disruption. Be it that we never checked in what the real time will of the people is. Well, I mean, just uh, taking that a little further, if we end up in a scenario where we, we do indeed you know, put the options to, to the electorate at, through a second referendum, then I suppose um, the one thing that I would say is that it's going to be quite a battle um, for both sides. Uh, there was, uh, some, all this week we've had quite um, uh, a considerable amount of polling on the question of no deal versus remain or... May's deal versus no deal, and one of the one of the surveys that certainly stood out to me was that if if you uh, put no deal uh, versus uh, remain, which is an unlikely scenario, but on that on that score, no deal is ahead of remain. Uh, if you put May's deal ahead of no deal, uh, May's deal is ahead, but only slightly, uh, and I think it's it's impossible to avoid the conclusion that if we end up with a second referendum, which I think if the Prime Minister's deal is voted down and she's unable to get it through, I'm increasingly of the view that a second referendum is the only way through, uh, through this, um, then I think we, either way we are, it is going to be a toy cost. It, 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 is, uh, it is not going to be as clear cut as some of our colleagues in, in the media are, are, are making, making us believe. Well, and partly because of Nothing. Europe, well, but this is the point. It doesn't. But, but, but partly just because of Europe too. Which and we and one of my frustrations, just to throw this out there, is our debate about Brexit has been incredibly, incredibly insular. It has been utterly focused on what it means for the UK and the domestic risks of Brexit. And there are obvious reasons as to why why it's been that way. But we have completely lost sight 
of the broader European landscape. And uh, the challenge, I think, certainly for both sides in the, in the debate will be how voters are interpreting this question, not only in terms of what does it mean for them in the UK, but how does the UK now sit in what is a rapidly changing European space? Mm. Mm. Because if you, if you work back from the point of view, as I try and do at all times, from the average voter, not from the highly kind of political obsessive news junkie like probably most of us maybe are, um, the average voter you know, will have just got general noise through from Europe over the last two years, which would have been you know, populism in Italy, populism in Germany, a crisis in Catalonia, uh, divides between north and south over the economy, Greece and lingering disputes. The offer, I'm just being deliberately provocative for the sake of conversation in a way and discussion, but the offer has not become clearer to the average voter. If anything, it's become more complicated, more complex. And you, I, my plea, if we end up having this debate all over again, is we cannot have a rerun of what was an incredibly insular debate simply about the economic mm, effects of if, Brexit. If you have if. that debate, don't be surprised by an equally surprising referendum outcome. The I debate has to be broader. It has to be more nuanced. It has to be, uh, I think, more, more ambitious. I, I wanted to talk about the ECJ, but I'm hoping that you will throw us a few questions about that because I, I am conscious of the time. I just want to talk about the response to Brexit. And you began at the beginning, Matthew, saying that your concern was that a lot of the, the issues that people had that led them to vote to leave haven't been addressed. What are they still? And very briefly, if you can, how do you, how do you address them? Well, I mean, um, if you work back from the, the evidence that we have on, on the leave vote, then it's the, the key questions are, how do you reform freedom of movement? Uh, and how do you regain some sense of control and influence over um, domestic law and institutions reclaiming sovereignty from the EU? Uh, how do you do that? Uh, through some kind of Brexit deal that delivers on those outcomes. Um, there are friends of mine who say, well, we, we could have dealt with the grievances of leavers while we were in the EU. Um, my reply to that is, yes, but we weren't doing a very good job of actually dealing with those grievances. And this is a difficult conversation. The only way through, polar, through this polarisation, you know, in my view, is uncomfortable conversations. We weren't dealing with the fact that London and the South East gets a wholly disproportionate amount of investment and transport and education and other regions of the UK. I gave a talk two weeks ago in Wales, and people are still visibly angry about an economic and social settlement in the UK that that leaves regions behind and, and leaves them feeling completely shut out from our settlement. We've not talked about how to regenerate England's coastal communities and why they have such a lack of inward investment. We've not talked about why the quality of education in the Northeast is so much lower than it is in the Southeast. We've not talked about political reform or how to change uh, our institutions and perhaps which ones we should start moving out of London to other regions of the country. We've, we've not had this interesting debate that we should have had about how do you reform the social and economic settlement. And if you genuinely think that we can do that while we're in the EU, then my advice would be start talking yes. about it. Because if you're only talking about trade and if you're only talking about this through the prism of rational choice, economic costs and benefits, then don't then ask, well, why is nobody changing their minds? Because the Leave vote was never primarily a vote about uh, profit maximization or economic self-interest. Can, can I just say, I absolutely 100% agree with you, and uh, not just for plugging it, but it's really important, because again, that's where we've started work. We've actually got a Remain deal. It's called Remain Plus, and that's what I think was missing here. We didn't sort of almost write that deal. Um, and so we talk about, in Remain Plus, we talk about the um, reforms, both domestically and the ones we should seek if we remain in the EU, and it is all those things. Because um, just from my personal experience, I, the one thing missing out there, so I sat on the board of the Centre for Social Justice for two years. I, I co-authored uh, two reports on, on uh, Britain. And the issues, the pol our politicians have not addressed the reforms that actually needed to be addressed. We've always said it's the EU's fault. Mm. So their political um, lack of ambition and their policy um, if you like, failures have been blamed on the EU. And that's where we need to start explaining. And politicians have got to be much more honest on whatever party they belong to, that they've actually not addressed these things for decades. 
let's take your questions now. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Tell us your name and an organisation that you represent, if that's appropriate. And if you've, you're addressing your question to anyone in particular, please let us know who it is. Let's just start here. Thanks, Martin. It's Jennifer Holroyd from Bankside Assembly. Um, it's probably Jennifer, sure. you slightly off microphone. I think you might just yeah. hold it a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Jennifer Holroyd. Uh, probably Ronan and Ma Matthew. Um, we've seen a couple of prominent Eurosceptics speaking, speaking in favour of May's deal, including Liam Fox on the radio this morning. But what do you think their game plan is? And uh, what, what will be their sort of breaking point <laughs> <laughs> to switch <laughs> sides? I think the, uh, uh, the view among some Eurosceptics, to be blunt, is just get past March. Uh, the so-called, you know, the Michael Gove school of thought, I suppose, which is the deal's inadequate, it's not perfect, but don't become the generation of conservative Eurosceptics who had Brexit within their grasp and then accidentally lost it and uh, laid the groundwork for a second referendum and then a, a, a Remain uh, vote and, and, and then became that generation that, that, that really uh, lost uh, that goal. So for, for many Eurosceptics, particularly within the sort of mainstream conservative wing, it's about getting, just getting the withdrawal agreement through and then, and then what they hope will be a significant reshaping over the longer term, whether that's legally possible or not, Ronan will have thoughts. But there is another Eurosceptic camp, of course, um, which perhaps Jim is closer to, with the view of, well, this deal is so utterly inadequate, um, it's not even Brexit in any meaningful form, and, and, and therefore there should be a, a sort of continuation of campaigning to, to try and get a, a, a sort of a real meaningful uh, uh, Brexit. And that's, that's the issue, that we've, we've, we've now basically seen the Leave vote rupture into, into or the Leave, the Leave campaigners rupture into two, and so too, by the way, have Remainers. Mm. And this is always you the problem for Remainers, that Remainers have broken in two. Half of Remain says, overturn it, get rid of it, I don't want it, bring yeah. back Remain. And the other half basically say, I don't like it, mm. I really don't like where we are, but I accept it and we've got to somehow make it work out. Well, I think there's two possibilities. One is that he, say for instance, Liam Fox, finally realised that this is all the EU can give. They won't give anymore, and he's afraid of a no deal. No deal is very scary. If he's really cynical, it's also possible that a lot of the damage from no deal or leaving is front-loaded. Maybe he's hoping cynically over time that the, EU can, the UK could secretly slowly prepare better for a more comprehensive break later on. I don't think that would really work, but well, it could be well, that. But I, I think probably good. no deal is a frightening option, and maybe he realised the EU cannot and will not give any more. Okay, next question. Yeah, well, yes. George, just sorry. Yes. Sorry, can hear. Thank you. Nikita Parks, Brunel University. Is the current impasse not the inevitable outcome of believing that somehow the Good Friday Agreement and the Lisbon Treaty are actually separable when in fact they're not and that the decision needs to be either stay and uphold the Good Friday Agreement or leave and abandon it. Shall we go first on that one? Yeah. It is it's hard it's because uh, the Good Friday Agreement was written on the assumption that Britain would never leave the EU. True. Uh, there are not that m that there are some references, but not that many references to EU law in it. But the whole the whole system assumes that. And it is true that I think for I'm not for many Brexiteers they just didn't really care. It is quite interesting uh, that the EU has been bent over backwards to accommodate the interests of its member, the Republic of Ireland, to the extent that. The UK has not done for Northern Ireland, or certainly Boris Johnson, na now, now at the DUP conference. You must <laughs> wonder how I ended up here. But he, <laughs> he's now speaking at the DUP conference. But he didn't, didn't care. He thought some damage to the Northern Ireland peace process is worth it to get to the promised land of Brexit Britain. So it's right that the Good Friday Agreement is based on EU law. It can probably salvage much, uh, much of it. And the, the current deal, uh, Mrs. May's deal, ends up in fact, uh, respecting the Good Friday Agreement by, to some degree, detaching the Nor Northern Ireland from the UK economically. But that's the case, that the, that's the choice Britain made. And simply for Gibraltar, remember, yes. Britain is now going to be renegotiating its relationship, Gibraltar's relationship with Spain, in a context where it's the weaker party. 
1986 was the stronger party because in the EU and Spain had to let Gibraltar have free movement. Now Britain's renegotiating Britain, Gibraltar's status in a position of weakness because it, it really needs a deal for the, for, for the, UK, for the EU. Uh, it, this is not existential. The, and that's one, five seconds. The German car industry and the German business industry have said to Angela Merkel, the integrity of the single market is more important than the fact that we sell more cars to Britain. So it's a fantasy to think that the German car makers or Italian Prosecco makers are going to make Britain get a cherry-picked deal. That's a yeah. it comes down to money. Yeah, I mean, something I found very frustrating is, and I, I, I know I've only just met Ronan Stan, I'm sure he gives me the benefit of the doubt and says that I'm not one of the people who's, yeah, yeah, one of the levers who doesn't care about the Good Friday Agreement. I do, for family reasons. My, my wife is from South Armagh. I spend a lot of time on the, when I say on the Irish border, three miles from the Irish border. In, in the north. My wife is an Irish citizen. It's something I've spoken about a lot in the European Parliament and Committee. But what I find very frustrating is how the Sinn Féin narrative, and, and I have to say Sinn Féin played this very cleverly in the European Parliament. They sold the narrative that it was all about peace in Northern Ireland. Now, I have nephews and nieces who have just finished university at university at the moment, grown up outside of the Troubles. There's, been, you know, there's another generation, two generations now being born, just the second generation now, being born outside of Troubles. And there is no desire from anybody, from Sinn Féin, from the DUP, from anywhere, with regards I to, I to, I to go back to the Troubles or for a hard border. It's never been, never been the case. Nobody has suggested it. The Irish government haven't, the British government have. Okay, I'm, I don't think they have. Well, if, if, if you, you leave if the you, single market, if, if you, if you, the border results. Yeah. And if you, if you take an action that inevitably results in another be, action, you intend the second action. But there has to be, there <laughs> has to be, there has to be the will from from the European Union to support the Irish government on this. Because, well, because um, we've, had, we've had a special relationship with, with the Republic of Ireland since 1923. That was when the Common Travel Area was formed. And that was a year after the Irish Civil War. Um, we, we've had reciprocal arrangements. The Irish people have the right to live, work. And, you know, that's, that's one part of the European Union where, of course, free movement will continue in both directions because, because of the Common Travel Area. So I think, I think we need a far more pragmatic approach to this, actually, and the, uh, the understanding that the guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement aren't the European Union, they're the, they're the, Irish, uh, the Irish states, the, uh, the United Kingdom government and the political parties in Northern Ireland. I'd like to try and rattle through as many questions as I possibly can. We've got one here and a few more. I'll come to you in just one second. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so it's Matthew Blakemore. Um, my question really is in regards to the political situation in the UK at the moment and how we got into this situation in the first place. So David Cameron didn't tell the British people that, Gina will know this a lot better than I do, but the EU law um, actually have ways of um, restricting immigration from the EU. Um, and I don't think David Cameron was ever um, honest with the UK about, about this. And then on secondly, Theresa May re released her letter this week uh, to the nation where she claimed that there would be 394 million extra for the NHS. And I categorically asked Anna Selber, you know, is this actually real? Is there going to be a Brexit dividend? And she said, absolutely not. This was completely um, irresponsible. So, so what's the answer, really? Uh, so Please, I'm not what, what's the, your answer, the answer about how, how do we get our political leaders to start being honest with the public about no 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 I, I, this, this, this has street. got to be um, look I'm a transparency campaigner and one of the things ongoing whatever happens with Brexit is that we have to have uh, accountable MPs and at the moment they are not accountable they uh, are supposed to abide by this thing called the Nolan principles there are seven principles and if you actually ticked any of those off, we wouldn't have any MPs. I mean, that's a, the problem. But on a really practical note, can I just say on, on Cameron and the immigration, because the detail, again, is very important. Um, yes, we could have restricted, like Belgium, we could. There's an article that we could have done that. Actually, under Cameron, they did do an assessment, an audit, to see. And the decision was made not to, import, not to Im, Im, implement those border checks because of the cost. So the, there was an assessment. Uh, there was an impact, and it said the costs of border costs and everything wouldn't, would have been too high. So freedom of movement was, was much better. Secretary. So, so, I mean, and, and uh, secondly, on, on, I know the person who was in, somebody who was in the room with Merkel and Cameron, and he was, Mrs. Merkel advised Cameron when he was going to call the referendum to do remain and reform. That was her advice, and he ignored her. 
So, I mean, this could have ended up very differently. But, I mean, I, I think the, the issue of MPs not telling the honest truth is something we really, really do have to think about. How, how do we hold them to account? How do we have transparency in the future? We pay their wages. They should actually tell us the truth. I do agree with you completely. Thank you. Next question. Tony Czarnecki, Sustances. When I look at this poster, it reminds me about the values. And what am I discussing? Money and cars. That was the problem with the debate in the first place, and Matthew Goodwin said about insularity. But this is geographical insularity. We should also think about temporal insularity. What will happen in 10 years' time? We are no longer changing at a linear pace. We are changing exponentially. Mm. If any Brexiteer think that we will re-enter the union at some stage on the same terms, well, I ask the mm, panel whether one, they, they think it will happen. Thank you. I don't want Sorry, yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to. I don't want to re-enter the European Union on any terms. Um, I think it's very clear the direction it's going. Um, there was a mention about Irish neutrality earlier. I sit on a foreign affairs committee. A report last last week we voted on on the common foreign and security policy. The rapporteur David McAllister, Angela Merkel's arguably her closest uh, political ally, uh, uh, C CDU um, MEP, leads the foreign affairs committee. Tipped her. Tipped her to go to the top in Germany. And this is just one of the comments from his report. Stresses the time has come for the European Union to take its destiny into its own hands, takes the, EU, the view that the EU should embrace its role as a fully fledged sovereign political power in international relations. What does that say for Irish neutrality? What does that say for Austrian neutrality? What does that say for Swedish neutrality? And what does that say for Finland on the border with Russia and the sensitivities there? We have to accept that the European Union has trained so much. We've heard the calls from Manfred Weber, who will soon be president of the European Commission, calling for qualified majority voting on taxation matters. And I speak as someone who used to be pro-European. Well, we have to accept the direction that the European Union is heading. And that is why I stand by my vote, how I voted now I campaigned in that referendum in 2016. I think, um, you know, would we end up rejoining? I think there are two things that are quite interesting. One is, if you assume under the Fixed Term Parliament Act that we aren't going to have a general election until 2022, um, then you know, that election will come after 12 years of Conservative uh, government. And I think you could make a pretty convincing case for why the fundamentals at that point would actually favor the Labour Party. Um, now, of course, one of the, one of the peculiarities of today's Labour Party is that it's led by not just one person but I think a, a faction and a very well entrenched faction that probably would have very little interest in rejoining the European Union um, because they perceive the EU to be an unnecessary constraint on the broader economic uh, and social project that they want to enact. Now that will increasingly um, uh, find itself in tension with, with population change and the fact that you know, younger people today are generally more instinctively pro-EU than older people and that will have effects uh, on Britain's population. Um, but again, I'll just insert one caveat on that. Just, you know, I have a ready-made uh, ready focus group at my disposal at Canterbury with uh, 300 passionate uh, Corbynistas um, <laughs> who, who, by the way, my first years were born in 2000. They weren't even eligible to vote in the 2016 referendum. Um, they don't remember the financial no. crisis, never mind Tony Blair and 9-11. Uh, you know, this is a completely different generation with completely different reference points. But the one thing, I, you know, when I asked them to put up their hands if they would like to see a second referendum, um, would, they, would they like to see Britain rejoin the European Union if we end up leaving? Um, the one thing I would say is that for, for my students, who maybe aren't wholly representative of their group, they aren't climbing the walls on this issue, okay? There isn't a revolutionary fervor in the room. It's not like a 1968 <laughs> moment, right? They are more concerned about tuition fees, housing markets, um, why did Generation X and the baby boomers yeah. get so much and we've got so little, mm -hmm. intergenerational fairness. And so I think if, if, you know, in terms of pinning hopes on the Labour Party, pinning hopes on generational change, which I often see written about in the papers and so on, I think it's more complex than that. Um, and I think we need to be aware of, of that complexity uh, and how that plays out. Definitely, and then I'm going to try and get through as many as we possibly can, as 
Hamill, please. Yeah. I almost think we're in like a revolutionary moment in a bizarre way because when you said there were two things said, nobody can predict what's going to happen next. Two characteristics of revolutionary moments. Nobody can predict what's going to happen next. And everything is incredibly unstable. Mm, yes. So we that. don't know where we're going. I could find and that is a, a strange <coughs> place to be. It's almost like what, what used to be told in the 1980s, the, uh, what, was, what was the word for it? Breaking the mould. That we've actually broken, the, the SDP was founded to break the mould, which they, the mould broke them actually, but, <laughs> uh, but I think we're actually at a, a mould-breaking moment. Now, I've got a position, I've got a question for Gina. I had a position really which says, for what, what the demo, I'm for a democratic exit, which no. means that Northern Ireland and Scotland should remain in the European Union, and England and Wales should leave the European Union but remain in the single market and the customs union because we didn't vote for anything other than that. Now, that's a strict interpretation. And if we ignore Ireland and Scotland, then where we're heading towards is the breakup of the UK. That is somewhere down the track in this, in this, mm. in this moment. So my question for Gina is this, okay? There's a commentary. I mean, there's some very good moment uh, points made about the fact we don't know what's going on all the time but that's a normal part of our politics by the way um can you ask the question i need i need questions. all of everybody's questions the have question got to be really this, okay. brief and serve the answers we're going to get through between a ratification referendum where you vote yes or no to the deal and one that includes an attempt to reverse what we decided to do which is much more problematic so i think we should just go for ratification only and you'll get the you'll get Remainers and Leavers on the side to do that. So my, uh, I think the question you were asking me is probably about the, the pe public vote, mm -hmm. as I call it. Yeah. I actually don't want it unless it's the last resort, because I do believe in our mm -hmm. representative democracy, and I do think MPs should be sort of resolving this rather than always handing it back to the people to resolve. So I would only see it uh, as for all the problems I think it will cause as a very, very last option. So I do not think it's, it's what we should automatically uh, do. I know. I, I differ from that view with lots of other people who are on that side and that support mm. that because it's not going to be a simple process. How would you then have, you know, would we have time to do an inter, uh, independent commission to look at the, what both sides are saying? Um, the, uh, some people saying it'll take six months, others nine months, but actually, you know, the best predictor of, of the future tends to be the past. Um, you know, it's what I do in investments. And, to your revolution point there, I'd say every 100 years or so, we get to a point where we actually do end up at the revolutionary moment. And I think the I most think important have. thing from all of this is for the people of Britain who live in Britain to take responsibility of what was their part in contributing to where we are. That's politicians, that's business owners, that's community leaders, because actually this didn't just happen <coughs> overnight. We have been going down this, and, and as um, Matthew says, you know, I, I do a lot of work in, in schools and universities, and I know that many students don't know who Tony Blair is. And that, I mean, I ask the question. It's one of my first questions I ask. So, you know, and, and that's how their future is very different. And they'll, we will survive whatever it is. But if we do get to a people's vote, a public vote, whatever is on there, there will not be our gift. It will be the MPs and the Electoral Commission who decide and test what will be the, on the ballot paper. Whatever that outcome is, if it's exactly the same, whatever it is, Everybody is going to have to agree this is an amnesty. You stop it and you get back to looking after this country. Because we, have, we are negligent. We are not looking after the people who voted mm. leave. Mm. We really aren't. Uh, very quickly, Jim. Very quickly. Um, I think you've missed the boat, so I think we had the revolutionary moment. I think it was two years ago when we had the referendum, when against the advice of the establishment of political parties and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, the British people did vote to take back control. We are at a revolutionary moment. Remember Edmund Burke, who says when you, when you fiddle with things that are long established, you really can't predict the consequences of doing so. 45 years of governance totally woven into the EU. It's going to be very unpredictable. And the European Journal of International Law this week said they're not even sure that the EU would let Britain back in. Yes. Yes. And that is it. Yeah. Um, Alison Miller. For evil um, to leave your good in fact, um, encapsulated my question so I'll be brief and it's about um, how we look after those people who voted leave. Uh, the thing about the Bre um, I have to confess I voted remain but I held my nose to do it um, is that uh, no in the, all the campaigning uh, the, the critical thing was that the cost of it uh, was never explained as uh, Ronan said but also whatever happens those 
Leave voters will be crushingly disappointed that their regions, far from getting more of the cake, will get less. Even less. And how do we Even politically less. deal with it? Absolutely. Um, does anyone want to speak to that, Matthew? Only to say briefly that uh, Gordon Brown recently suggested that we should actually think about having a, a national commission of some description to, to, to look seriously at that particular issue. I suppose you might argue that we had for a long time uh, organizations like the Social Mobility Commission, like the Sutton Trust and others who have been pointing to these issues for years if not decades. It was of course in 2006 that DCLG first said we've got a problem with coastal Britain. If you go into these communities, as I, I did a lot of interviewing in those communities, you spend five minutes in um, Clacton, for example, and it doesn't take you long to figure out why people actually said, I would like to shake up the settlement. And to be honest, I don't really care what's on the other side because it's got to be better than the current yes. settlement. And that's the issue. We have to really get serious about that. I think we do need to think about citizens' assemblies, a deliberative model of democracy where we can get people talking about these issues. Absolutely. Part of we didn't get on to deliberative democracy, mm. did we? Uh, Penny Hill. My question concerns the fact that the European Court in Luxembourg is about to make a decision on whether or not the UK can unilaterally revoke Article 50. Now, if they decide that we can, going back to the point Gina made about um, our MPs, our representatives of the people, do you believe that they should, Parliament, should direct the government to revoke Article 50? Um, just a really quick, the, 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 the date for that judgment is now the 4th of December. Um, we've never, been, a bit like the Supreme Court, all 26 judges sat, which was quite remarkable. We will have to see the nerve, because the, the AG, the President of the Court, has his own views on, on if that court should intervene. It's quite complicated. but. So far, the government have said, irrespective of that judgment, it is not the political um, decision will not be to revoke. So they have already made that statement that it does, they don't really care what the judgment is. Um, but there, there, are, there are problems with, I mean, it's so difficult. There, there, there are so many other outcomes here. You, you would need to, to unilaterally withdraw the letter. I mean, Mrs. May could just say, OK, you guys were all bullying me for the last two years. If you think it's so easy, I will I withdraw the letter. And here you are. You have it. And you see what you can do if you think my deal is so terrible. She could do that. Um, <laughs> it'd be quite an interesting one if she did. Um, but I think it, it, would, it would cause so many problems for our country domestically if, if any politician just decided. Because this has got to be about what happens to Britain. It's not just about what happens to people who think that, we, that other people who voted leave made a mistake. To tell them that they were wrong and ignore them, withdraw that letter, I think would be the most damaging thing that we could do, <coughs> not to our democracy, but actually to people who voted to leave. And that's why I think there has to be another solution which includes the people who voted to leave. I really don't think the law, the law, the black and white letter of the law, which I so respect, has to operate in the real world <laughs> in society and <coughs> it has to have a place in understanding about how societies live together. I'm going to take gross liberties and keep you here for another th two or three minutes. Down there, in the back row. Um, David Abraham, uh, Global Diplomatic Forum. Um, a couple of points. Uh, number one, if we were to go to a <coughs> people's vote, um, what would be the uh, consequences? Because I believe the uh, existing uh, MEP seats have all been redirected to uh, have, other countries. Yes, yes. And also, uh, I believe uh, Theresa May put £800 million aside for an election next year. So I'm just a bit conflicted as to which way uh, that's going to go. And the other question is towards uh, Jim Carver. Um, I'd like to ask him if there's any possibility of Europe uh, bending uh, towards uh, you know, our viewpoint, which is also the viewpoint of countries like Italy and other countries who will be jumping on the bandwagon to break up, uh, break up the EU. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim first, the Ronan, sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm very quick, I'm very so qu sorry. Very quickly, with 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 I don't know why I'm leaning into your microphone, I forgot I'm wearing one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, the, 20, the EU 27 want those seats back, they've reallocated, they're making, they're making preparations now to, 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 
to sort of, you know, ahead and forecast and political parties are actually sort of working about how they're going to be campaigning candidates and whatnot. Well, both seats are gone, the MEPs are gone. I'm, I'm very happy to be one of those turkeys who voted for Christmas um, from a personal point of view. So we're not, we're not going to be, be there after the end of March. Um, the, the other point was uh, you were talking about contagion the European Union it going into other countries. And I think this, is, this has been the biggest problem with regards to, not all, but some quarters of the European Union. They are very aware of, of the rise of, as, as Matthew would say, populism across. And we're going to see a very, very different European Parliament at the next, after the next European election. You're going to see, see countries, parties such as the AFD in Germany do very well. You're going to actually see parties do very well on the left in countries such as Spain and Catalonia, in uh, the Catalonian region. Um, you're going to see, see, you know, very, very high scores in France again, um, and actually in Eastern Europe. Uh, and We're going to have to move on very quickly. Okay, I'm so taking think, terrible liberties with yes, the panel's I think time. It's time, time isn't it, really? the, court, uh, the court, I think, is very unlikely to give the absolutely unilateral withdrawal right to the UK. They probably need some uh, deal. The, the other states have to go along with that to some degree. They may not because the European Parliament seats, things have been reallocated. And even if they did, I think symbols matter. They shouldn't have had a referendum, but once you do, you can't just no, you can't Last question it. from the... Uh, the uh, Neil Nerver, a so Labour councillor in Brent, which is now a People's Vote Borough. Um, I just wanted to ask why, during, not during the referendum, but post-referendum, no one has been willing to have an intelligent discussion about freedom of movement, not least because it isn't just affecting people who come to this country, it's going to affect a generation of people who leave this country. And why has no one been willing to actually grapple and actually come up, if Britain is going to leave, with some smart arrangements which could have been had, Belgium and so on, as part of well, the negotiations? Well, why has it been this re <coughs> very quickly? <coughs> yeah. You talked about a, you talked. Yeah, I just say you talked about you talked about culture wars. There's a version of culture war which is down to austerity. I don't think it was simply down to immigration. Yeah. I mean, I don't buy the evidence that austerity caused the vote for Brexit. It's not convincing. The studies that have tried to make that claim have been pretty, uh, have been undermined pretty quickly. I mean, it, 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 look, the issue about freedom of movement, um, voters were misled consistently uh, from the early 2000s onwards. Prior to the accession of EU member states, going back to Gina's point about irresponsible political leaders, the numbers that they were given initially were way off. They were then told that there would be a net migration cap that would bring numbers down to the tens of thousands, even though the government at the time knew that that was really undeliverable in the context of EU membership. And then, as a consequence, those anxieties found their expression through the vote for Brexit. Now, today, we are seeing some very significant shifts in migration patterns. Uh, EU net migration uh, as revealed yesterday uh, into the country is at its lowest uh, level since 2012, but non-EU migration into the country is at its highest level since 2004. Mm. So the, the irony of where we are is that actually the country is going to uh, probably become you know, less white, more diverse uh, quite quickly, even though it's having lower numbers of EU nationals coming in to, to the country uh, compared to earlier years. And that will, of course, fuel a sense among leavers, obviously, that, well, hold on a second, what happened to Brexit? Even though, actually, overall, over the long term, levels of immigration might fall, the country will become more diverse. Mm -hmm. Just one quick thing to say as an example. I was out of London um, uh, in Minehead explaining about immigration, um, and I was being shouted at by the audience saying, no, leaving the EU, all of you won't be able to be here because there was this perception that it meant that it was everybody from everywhere. And I said, actually, it'll be more people who look like me because we need immigration in this country. And I got shouted at, you're telling a lie, that's not true. So we do actually have I'm to start, it's, a, it's another example of us not explaining, actually. We've not explained the EU, we've not explained immigration, we've not explained how the threats are to our po All of these things are about policy and about explanation and about a disconnect with the political classes and actually the people of our country. Right. I'm so sorry we haven't got time for any more questions. I've, I've overrun and I shouldn't have done at all. Um, clearly, uh, Leavers and Remainers, generally speaking, are not happy with the withdrawal no, agreement. Some people think it's the best we can get. Some people think it shouldn't happen. As you know, this is going to carry on for months, if not years. There's a realigning of UK politics, we've heard, and yet we remain highly polarised. There's a lot still to be decided. We don't know yet what the future relationship is going to be. 
with the, between the UK and the EU. I just want to um, remind you um, that EU citizens are eligible to vote in the, European, the EU elections in May. Um, there's a website called thistimeimvoting.eu <laughs> where you can find lots of information and uh, you can even volunteer to help promote that vote. We've reached the end of today's event, but uh, do continue the conversation over lunch outside. On behalf of the European Parliament UK Information Office and the UCL European Institute, I would like to thank our guest speakers, Ronan McRae, Jim Carver, Jean MEP, for now. Not for long. Uh, <laughs> Gina Miller and Matthew Goodwin. Thank you all for an insightful discussion. Thank you.